A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, members of Shalom Baptist Church, and those of you who are watching this video, wherever you might be. I'm Christian, and it's my privilege to bring to you the word of the Lord this morning. Now, it's been three weeks since we were last able to gather together um, and uh, in church to see one another. And of course, although we are sad that we're not able to see one another face to face, we have to thank God, and I personally thank God for the ability uh, to reach all of you with the word of the Lord, uh, even via this video. And uh, the internet's a wonderful thing, and it's especially a wonderful thing when it is used uh, to glorify God. And I hope that if you're watching this video, that this message will be edifying to you and a blessing to you this morning. The title for this morning's message is When God Counsels the Discouraged. When God counsels the discouraged. And our principal text this morning is taken from the book of 1 Kings in chapter 19 and verse 9 to verse 13. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 9 to verse 13. And the scripture reads, And he came thither unto a cave, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Today, we are going to look at the subject of discouragement. We're going to look at what discouragement is all about. What's so dangerous about discouragement and how God counsels the discouraged. The first thing we're going to look at this morning is lingering in the hallway of discouragement. Uh, lingering in the hallway of discouragement. Now there's a story of uh, a man by the name of James Tillis or James Quick Tillis as he was known. And he's a former uh, heavyweight boxer who boxed out of Chicago, and he was born in Oklahoma, and he moved to Chicago. And he recounts a story of how uh, when he moved to Chicago, the very first day he moved to Chicago, he got off his bus and he had with him uh, two cardboard suitcases. And he got off the bus and he saw a really tall tower, and he, he looked up that tower and he said, I am going to conquer Chicago. And when he looked down, he realized that the two uh, briefcases that he had on either side of him uh, had been stolen. And uh, of course, at that moment, his heart just fell. All that determination he had, all that courage he had uh, to conquering Chicago uh, now seemed uh, so far away. The first thing he had to do uh, was to basically get his, his, his main necessities uh, for the next few days. And uh, oftentimes, discouragement hits us uh, just like this. Now, we're all no strangers to discouragement. Uh, every single one of us has experienced discouragement uh, in some form of another. Sometimes it can be as small as just uh, as failing a test or an exam, or it can, it can be as big as uh, perhaps losing a job or losing a loved one. Sometimes uh, it comes in smaller doses and you have things that keep hitting you and, 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 and hitting you until you just can't take it anymore. And the thought of even getting out of bed in the morning uh, seems just distasteful. And sometimes discouragement hits us uh, with one punch and sometimes with, with multiple punches. But the question really is this, what is so distasteful about discouragement? What is so distasteful about discouragement? You see, discouragement is not an addition. It's a subtraction. Now, what do I mean by uh, discouragement not being an addition but a subtraction? You see... Discouragement 
is the extinguishing of courage. Discouragement is the extinguishing of courage. It is, the, it is to dishearten, it is to depress the spirits, to be dejected and to, to be deprived uh, of confidence. Uh, there are many ways that people deal uh, with discouragement. Some of them go for counseling. Uh, others try to cheer themselves up by di distracting themselves. Uh, but today we're going to see how God deals uh, with discouragement. In our principal text, uh, we come across a man that most of you already know. Uh, now, this man is no stranger to us. He's a man of God, uh, not just any man, but a prophet of God. And the Bible introduces him to us in a few words, just uh, two chapters before in 1 Kings in chapter 17 and verse 1. In 1 Kings in chapter 17 and verse 1, and the scripture reads, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilad. Uh, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilad. Uh, it is interesting how the Bible introduces one of the two men in the Bible who never tasted death. Now, of course, when we introduce great men, uh, we oftentimes talk about, we put their accolades, we put their titles either before or after their names, but here we find this great man uh, being just introduced from the place uh, from which he's from, uh, Elijah the Tishbite. In Hebrew, uh, his name is Eliyahu, and literally it means that Jehovah is God. And indeed, that really was his ministry. His ministry uh, was about showing uh, 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 God, uh, showing, uh, showing everyone that God was none other uh, than Jehovah. And uh, for all the mighty works we see that God wrought to this prophet, uh, one of the things we see is that he was still a man. And, and like all men, Elijah was no stranger to discouragement. Elijah was no stranger to discouragement. Uh, you see, just one chapter before in 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, or rather one, one chapter before 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, we find uh, the prophet in one of the most courageous displays in all the Bible. Uh, one of the most, if, if, you, if you were to browse through the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation, this is probably uh, one of the most courageous uh, displays that you will find. Now, of course, just to give you a bit of a background here, there were, uh, when Israel, uh, Israel was, was one nation and after uh, King Solomon died, it was split into two. You have the northern tribe, which is called Israel, and the southern tribe, uh, which is called Judah. And of course, uh, Elijah was ministering to the northern tribes. And at that time, uh, we had the king by the name of Ahab and his wife, uh, Jezebel. And the marriage of Ahab and Jezebel uh, basically uh, rather reinforced uh, the worship of Baal. You see, up to up till this time, uh, many Israelites were worshiping Baal. Uh, there were a, a group of Israelites that were worshiping Baal, but it was still uh, pretty suppressed. It was more uh, by the side. It was more. It wasn't a, a sanctioned. Or it wasn't a main religion. But with the marriage of Ahab and Jezebel, and with Jezebel being a fervent uh, devotee of Baal, uh, we find that uh, uh, Baalism or the worship of Baal uh, becoming a state-sanctioned uh, religion, uh, a state religion, and uh, we find that uh, uh, eventually uh, God would promise uh, through Elijah uh, that uh, God would promise Ahab through Elijah that it would not rain for three years. And you know, we find that uh, it was a very wicked period in Israel. Uh, Jezebel was a very wicked uh, queen who would even uh, kill many of, of God's prophets. And uh, Elijah warned Ahab, uh, would, would, would prophesy to Ahab that there would be no rain for three years. And for three and a half years, uh, there was no rain in Israel. But after three and a half years, we find uh, that Elijah would challenge the prophets of Baal uh, to a contest. Uh, now, this is a very interesting part of Scripture uh, where one man 
would challenge 450 other men uh, to a contest uh, that would require a miracle. Now, this was how it was supposed to go. Uh, they were supposed to take two bulls and lay those bulls on an altar. And they were supposed to ask their, their gods, Elijah asking God, Jehovah, and the 450 prophets of Baal asking their God uh, to send down fire from heaven to consume the offering. And of course, we find that this would take place on, on Mount Carmel. And we would find the 450 prophets of Baal uh, just, just shouting and crying out uh, to their God from morning to evening. And some of them cutting themselves and, and shouting out, but nothing would happen. And then we find Elijah uh, would ask for water to be poured uh, on the sacrifice. And uh, he would... He would cry out to God and ask God to send fire and God would indeed send fire uh, to consume uh, the sacrifice. And of course, before the whole contest, Elijah would tell the people uh, that whoever, whichever God answers, uh, they would acknowledge as God. And true enough, the people there acknowledged Jehovah as God. And uh, Elijah commanded them to capture the uh, false prophets of Baal and he slew them by the brook. And uh, and we find uh, that uh, this was one of this is one of the most courageous episodes uh, to ever take place in the Bible. If if you were to look at uh, just this portion alone, uh, you would think that Elijah uh, was one of the most courageous men that ever lived. There are few other words one can use to, to describe uh, Elijah. Uh, in this entire encounter. But yet for all that display of courage, we see an almost unrecognizable version of Elijah just one chapter later. Just one chapter later. Now in the book of 1 Kings in chapter 19 and verse 1 to verse 3, the scripture reads, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a message unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now, of course, Ahab uh, would go to Jezebel and tell her about her 450 of her prophets uh, uh, being killed uh, by Elijah. And we find that Queen Jezebel, being the wicked queen that she was, uh, she would send uh, a, a, a letter to Elijah, uh, you know, threatening him and promising him that he was going to face the same fate, death, in 24 hours. Now, here we stop a while. Now, just imagine you have been given an old tattered Bible and that you flip to 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 1 and verse 2 and you come to the end of the page. And now you flip the page and you realize that this old tattered Bible has a couple of pages that, uh, you know, the, the, the next couple of pages have, has fallen out this old tattered Bible and uh, you, you probably would order a new Bible. And while you're waiting for this Bible, you had to guess the outcome of this entire scenario. Now, some of you would, would look at this and, and maybe after seeing what Elijah did on Mount Carmel, you would say, well, you know, I think Elijah would probably laugh at Queen Jezebel. Uh, he'd probably send a note back saying, well, try your best. Or maybe he would just uh, 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 send, uh, you know, uh, lightning down to strike uh, this wicked queen. And uh, you have all these uh, uh, deductions that you can make from Elijah's previous show of courage. But we find a very, a very different picture in 1 Kings in chapter 19 and verse 3. In 1 Kings in chapter 19 and verse 3, we read, And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. Now, the first instinct of this mighty prophet of God was to get up and run for his life. We find a courageous man uh, doing a rather cowardly thing. What caused the prophet of Jehovah God to run from the queen, uh, a queen that worshipped Baal? One word, discouragement. 
discouragement. You see, where great acts go, uh, Elijah had done great. I mean, you can probably imagine Elijah at home uh, praising God uh, for that, 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 that spectacular display, uh, that, that spectacular display of his power and his might. And uh, Elijah was probably enjoying the fact that he got to bring some form of revival to Israel. Uh, there were many people that saw this thing. There were many people that uh, who were worshipping Baal that after witnessing this would fall down their face and, 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 and declare that the Lord is God. And, uh, but instead of, um, instead of uh, uh, receiving an invitation uh, from Ahab to the palace, uh, instead of, of, of receiving a, a, a message that Ahab and Jezebel had, had repented from their sins, instead of receiving a message that, of thanks for being God's instrument uh, to bring rain back to the land, uh, he finds a death warrant. He finds a death warrant. Oftentimes, we experience our greatest disappointments and we, we oftentimes experience them right after the great highs of life. In fact, sometimes it can seem the higher the high, the lower the low. When things are going well, uh, we expect things to go well. We expect things to keep going well. Well, I just got a good job. Uh, my family is healthy. Everything's going great. And we, we, we imagine uh, that that's going to continue without uh, any pause, uh, without any dip. And uh, we, we seem to gain courage uh, from the fact that we're doing so well. Uh, but like Elijah, we find that none of us are immune uh, to receiving bad news at any time. And none of us are immune to discouragement. You see, Elijah was, though a prophet, he was a man just like any of us. He had to deal with discouragement. In fact, in the book of James, in the book of James in chapter 5 and verse 17, the scripture reads that Elias was a man uh, subject to, to like passions as we are. You see, the answer to understanding discouragement is in the word itself. When we derive our courage from events, when we derive our courage from circumstances, when we uh, remain on that, 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 when we are at that place where, where we are confident because of how things are going, when things don't go as we expect, we get discouraged. Our courage gets taken away. Our courage is diminished. And we find here Elijah himself uh, lingering in the hallway of discouragement. Now we're going to look at something different now and we're going to look at descending into the pits of despair. Descending into the pits of despair. Now, of course, we... we we look at discouragement and we, we ask ourselves, what's so bad about discouragement? Now, of course, there's a story of how the devil decided to have a garage sale. And on the day of the sale, uh, his tools were placed for public inspection. And uh, each tool that the devil had placed in front had its own price. And the customers would come and uh, the customers would have a look at all these tools, these, these dangerous looking, uh, 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 malicious looking tools. And they, they all had their own price on it. And, and, and one of the customers would walk by and he saw a very harmless, well, not, not too malicious looking tool uh, that seemed to be pretty worn, uh, but that seemed to have a very high price uh, right at the end of the table. And so the customer would point to it and ask him and say, well, uh, 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 why is this tool so expensive? And the devil would say, well, I have many tools. I have the tool of hatred, of lying, of envy, of lust of deceit, but this tool is better than them all. Uh, you see, this tool, uh, the, the devil would say, uh, costs such a high price uh, because uh, it's more useful to me than others. I'm able to pry open and get inside a man's heart uh, even when other tools fail. And the devil said he used it on everyone and therefore it costs that much. You see, people sometimes fail to see how dangerous discouragement can be. 
I mean, it might not seem as deadly as many other things, uh, but what few people realize is that if not handled properly, discouragement quickly turns to despair. No one starts out wanting to be in a state of despair. But when they linger in discouragement long enough, they find themselves there. If you go with me to the book of 1 Kings uh, in chapter 19 and verse 4, in 1 Kings in chapter 19 and verse 4, uh, we find ourselves in an interesting passage. In 1 Kings in chapter 19 and verse 4, the scripture reads, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Now we find Elijah having run away uh, from Jezreel uh, now in the wilderness. And uh, he finds a juniper tree. By the way, a juniper tree is also known as a, a broom tree. And it's known to be one of the most longed for trees in the wilderness. Now, of course, in the wilderness, you, uh, you, you often look for water, you look for shade. And when someone would find a juniper tree, uh, they would be relieved because for a while, uh, they would have some shade under which they could rest. And here we find uh, Elijah, who was not long ago simply discouraged now, suicidal, suicidal. From a mighty prophet to someone the Institute of Mental Health would forcibly admit for having suicidal tendencies. You know, it's funny if you think about it. If he really wanted to die, he could have just waited for Jezebel to help him with it. But he runs all the way into the wilderness and then he tells God, you know what, Lord, it's enough. Take my life. It's enough. You see, in verse 3, Elijah was discouraged and afraid. But now he is despairing. Now you ask him, what's the difference? What's the difference between discouragement and despair? You see, while discouragement is a loss of courage, uh, while discouragement is, is disheartening, uh, we find that Despair is a loss of hope. Despair is a loss of hope. It is said that, that despair uh, is, is, is a hopeless state and it is like an, an, an irritated child, an irritated child who when you take away uh, one of his playthings uh, would angrily throw uh, the rest of the things away. You know, it's, it's, it's very true. Oftentimes we find uh, that those who... who who claim to have suicidal tendencies uh, seem to forget that they have so many things in their life uh, that seem to be going right. They seem to forget all the blessings that they have and they seem to throw it all away uh, just because one toy uh, has been taken away. You know, the Apostle Paul uh, too understood this thing. Uh, in the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter 4 and verse 8, 2 Corinthians in chapter 4 and verse 8, uh, we come to a verse which reads, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. You see, the Apostle Paul was constantly facing difficulties and persecution on every side. I mean, you talk about persecution, you talk about discouragement. Here you have a man uh, who has been charged with a very important task of bringing the gospel to the Gentiles, and he seems to be hit everywhere he goes. I mean, you talk about whippings, you talk about shipwrecks, you, talk, you name it, and Apostle Paul would probably have gone through it. Uh, he, he would have uh, people misunderstanding him, uh, people misconstruing what he says. He would have problems within the churches themselves, problems outside of the churches. He would be persecuted and beaten. And yet he says this, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. The words perplex and in despair, uh, and despair in this verse, render two similar Greek words. Uh, we have for perplex the word aporomene, and for the words despair, ex aporomene. And, uh, 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 and I might not be pronouncing it exactly as it is, but uh, we have two words with the same root. Now, 
What's the difference between the two? They have the same root, but yet we find that they are, that they are translated two different ways, perplexed, yet not in despair. You see, the phrase, not in despair, can also be rendered not altogether without help or means. We find that believers are able to be in a state of confusion sometimes, of discouragement, of not knowing what's happening, but they never lose hope. They never lose hope because they know that help is always there for them. They know that help is always there if they need it, and they know that there is someone who is willing and waiting to help them. You see, many years ago, I, I spoke to a friend of mine who was constantly suicidal, and you know we would chat once in a while, and I talked to her, and I asked her, I said, why is it that you always talk about suicide? Why do you talk about uh, killing yourself and you know harming yourself, and why? And she said, and, and, and she would say that most of the time, she could not think about anything else other than the disappointments and negative things that happen in her life. Uh, she said, I would get up in the morning, and I have negative thoughts, and when I go to bed, I have negative thoughts. And of course, I didn't say this to her, but I realized that the only difference between uh, her and I was that, well, I too had ne uh, disappointments. I too sometimes had negative thoughts. Uh, but she dwelt on those thoughts and she dwelt on those disappointments a lot longer uh, than I did. Now, of course, I'm not saying uh, uh, there are people out there with a, a, a medical depression. There are people out there that might need medical help and I'm not discounting any of that. But what I'm trying to say is that when you dwell on those things that, that take away your courage long enough without taking some form of preemptive action, without seeking some form of help, what happens uh, is that you go down the pits uh, of despair. And we find that no one enters the, the room of despair without first lingering in the hallway of discouragement. You know, when you spend your time dwelling on those issues that discourage you, when you just spend day and night, uh, instead of, of looking to God, instead of looking to the Bible, instead of looking to what God has to say and what God wants to do, when you spend your entire time just thinking of what's going wrong, you know, this is not going well, I don't think this is going to go well, you know, man, life is just terrible, uh, you know, I, things are already not great and now I've got to deal with this COVID-19 thing and oh, things are not great and now, you know, it seems like my job is laying people off, oh, things are not great and now I've got some medical bills that have been racked up, you know, I, uh, my life is just filled with misery and this and that. What you find is that not long, um, uh, it's not going to be a long time before you find yourselves deep in the pit of despair. And uh, we find that when you allow your eyes to gaze long enough at your circumstances, when you allow your eyes to gaze long enough at what's going on, uh, this despair will soon follow. Now we find uh, two points lingering in the hallway of disappointment, descending into the pits of despair. And now we're going to go on to ascending onto the mount of understanding. Ascending onto the mount of understanding. Now, I'm no expert in counseling, but I've read a few books on counseling and, and uh, dealing with people who need counseling. And there are many different approaches uh, that counselors take when dealing with those who despair. Pastors try sometimes in vain uh, to encourage people that seem uh, unencourageable. Uh, you know, I've tried to, to I've, I've, I've dealt with different people and, and sometimes I, I speak to someone and you share with them and you try to speak them, uh, talk, talk them through all their issues and it sometimes seems that some people just don't seem to be able to get out of that pit of, you know, just lingering uh, in disappointment or despair. And uh, now today you might be discouraged. Uh, you might even be in despair or maybe you're not. But maybe you know someone that, that's discouraged or in despair. And, and you know, 
you don't know. You're trying to help them, but you don't know how. You're at a loss uh, with regard to how to help them. I think there's much we can learn uh, from how God deals with his despairing prophet. You know, oftentimes we look at people and we see, how does this person deal with the situation? How does that person deal with the situation? But I thank God that we have the Bible uh, which shows us how God deals with many different situations. Uh, if we go down to 1 Kings uh, in chapter 19 and verse 5 to 7, in 1 Kings in chapter 19 and, and verse 5 to 7, uh, we read, and as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold then an angel, an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. It is interesting to notice phase one of God's treatment for this severe depression, for this despairing prophet, rest, food, and drink. You see, the Lord didn't immediately answer his despairing servant. Instead, he allowed him rest and provision. I want you to notice the Lord's tenderness uh, here. Before he dealt with the internal problems uh, he dealt with the external. You see, my friends, the Lord knows our frame. The Lord pities us. He cares for us and he looks after even the smallest of our needs. I can't tell you how many times when I've been discouraged and I, I just am not able to think straight that just resting for a couple of hours uh, just gets my mind the right frame uh, to think things through. Some, we, sometimes we forget that we're in a body of flesh and blood. Uh, sometimes we forget that, that uh, the Lord allows us a time, a period of rest, uh, a physical rest before he deals uh, with our internal issues. And then we find Elijah making a 40-day journey to Mount Sinai and here is where we find the Lord dealing with the internal. And we, we, we come to a very interesting portion of scripture. And the scripture reads, In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 9, And he came thither unto a cave, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? By the way, the picture you see uh, is taken from uh, what is uh, suspected or what is most likely uh, the, the uh, Mount Sinai in Arabia. Uh, of all the, the, the places that have been identified that, could, uh, that, that, that uh, might be Mount Sinai, it seems that this mount meets most of the requirements. And of course, on this mount, uh, this was the only cave that was found. And so many believe that this was uh, actually the cave that Elijah himself uh, might have been in. Now, of course, we can't be dogmatic about that. Uh, but it's interesting just to look uh, at the, a possible site where this whole thing uh, could have happened. Now, the first thing the Lord says comes in the form of a question. What doest thou hear Elijah? What he's saying is this. I didn't ask you to come here. I mean, when did, Elijah, when did you receive my message telling you to come to the wilderness and the Mount of God? When did I tell you to leave Jezreel? When did I give you instructions to leave and walk 40 days in the wilderness before reaching the Mount? What are you doing here? And sometimes we look at these things and we say, oh, well, that's a question and we jump to the answer. But in this one question, laid all the answers. In this one question, lay all the answers. In 1 Kings, in chapter 19 and verse 10, in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 10, we read, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now Elijah tells God what he thinks the problem is. 
notice his focus. Number one, Israel has forsaken God. Bad. Number two, only I am left. Bad. And number three, they seek to take my life. Bad. You see, in the entire verse, the focus was on others and himself. If you look at the entire verse of verse 10, the entire focus was on himself and what was going on around him. God was nowhere in the picture. There is no mention of all the encouraging things that had just happened. No mention of the 450 prophets of Baal that were killed. No mention of the people that worshipped God, uh, that, that declared that he was God uh, when, when, the, uh, when, when God answered with fire. No mention of, uh, of the, 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 the revival that was experienced on Mount Carmel. You see, fear and discouragement only tied his mind to the dark side, the failures, and we often forget the mighty things wrought in our lives when we get to this stage. You know, we, 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 when, when things happen, oftentimes we start to make deductions. We start to, we start to make inferences about our lives. We say, oh, why is this happening? Oh, man, my life is, is, is terrible. My life is this and that. And we forget that not too long ago, before we entered the, the, the hallway of discouragement, things were going just fine. And just because we have been disappointed or discouraged, uh, we find ourselves uh, just focusing on the negative part of, uh, or the negative portion of our life, no matter how small or big it might be. Now we see God's response, and this is the interesting part. He didn't lecture Elijah. Now, you would expect him uh, to say, well, Elijah, you know, uh, where's your faith, Elijah? Elijah, come on, you know, uh, uh, don't you see I've done all these things for you? Elijah, don't you trust me? Elijah this, Elijah that, but no. He didn't try to point out that he failed to mention the good things. He asked him to stand on the mount before the Lord. He asked him to stand on the mount before the Lord. In 1 Kings, in chapter 9 and verse 11 and 12, the scripture reads in 1 Kings chapter, 1 Kings, sorry, 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 11 and 12, uh, the scripture reads, And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still small voice. You see, God's answer was not just going to be words. It was going to be a demonstration. You know, whenever I come to this, uh, these verses, I cannot but imagine the terrifyingly awesome sight. Uh, what a terrifyingly awesome sight that must have been. You see, Elijah needed to be reminded uh, that his God was greater than any, of, any problem or any discouragement that he had. Even the rocks would break apart like just uh, a clay uh, art pieces, uh, tin clay. You know, here was an awesome display of the power of God. You have wind, you have earthquake, you have fire. You know, by the way, you know, I try to go on Google and search for a picture that might just do this justice, uh, but, but you, you, you just can't find such a picture. You know, it must have been such an awesome, it must have been such a terrifying, awe-inspiring sight as the, as the ground shook. Uh, under Elijah. You see, number one, Elijah needed a reminder that the Lord is God. What an irony. His name is Eliyahu. His ministry was to show that the one true living God is none other than Jehovah. But he too needed to be reminded that he is dealing with one who is God. The problem is stated in verse 3 of chapter 19. In 1 Kings, in chapter 19 and verse 3, the scripture reads, And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. You see, from the time Elijah saw the message from Jezebel, his eyes had been in the, has been in the wrong place. His focus had been on the situation. He saw, he arose, he ran. You see, 
there was no Lord what's happening. There was no uh, 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 giving himself to a season of prayer. The moment he saw the letter, he arose and he ran. No time to pack food. <laughs> we know that uh, one day later in the wilderness, the Lord himself fed him. No time to think of anything else. No time to consider God. One of the biggest reasons we get discouraged is because we forget how much in control God is of everything. You know, we look at letdowns and we think all is lost. You know, but we forget that God could very well have not allowed us to go through those things if he chose not to allow us to go through those things. You know, we forget that if God had wanted to, uh, if God wanted to, he could change the situation around in a heartbeat, in, in less than a snap of a finger. You know, the, the, the book of Psalms in chapter 27 and verse 1, the book of Psalms in chapter 27 verse 1, if you have your Bibles and will turn with me, the scripture reads in Psalms 27 and verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You know, there's a story of an elderly woman who was greatly disturbed by her troubles. Some of them were real and uh, some of them were imaginary. But finally, after trying to fulfill her every whim, one tactful member of her family uh, told her, Grandma, we've done all we can for you. You'll just have to trust God for the rest. A look of absolute despair came over the face of that old woman. And she replied, Oh dear, has it come to that? And the relative commented, It always comes to that. So we might as well begin with them. You see, oftentimes we take our courage uh, from so many things that, that aren't supposed to be the source of our courage. And when we are let down by those things, we get discouraged, we are, we are let down, but we forget that the place to start is, where, is the place we always should start at. God, I know you're still in control. I know that you could have turned this around. I know that you could have stopped this from happening. You know, just a, a few days ago, I was in the uh, washroom and I have a, a small, uh, a kind of a, uh, I got a, a basically a step to, to the toilet that separates the toilet from the shower area. And um, on my way down, as I put my one of my, my foot down the step, I almost slipped and fell so bad. I would, probably would have hit my head. I probably would have, uh, got into a really serious accident. But that very day, I grabbed the sink. And I managed to steady myself, but I got a scare. Because that, was, that would have been a very, very uh, painful fall had I, had I uh, fallen. But you know, the first thing that came to my mind was this. I was able to, to, to find my footing because the Lord chose to protect me in that instance. I could have very well lost my footing. I could have very well you know, fallen, hit my head, and ended up in, in a very serious condition. But I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, grab that sink because my reflexes were good, because I, I just happened to be uh, uh, cautious. Far from it. The first thing that came to my mind is this, God is in control. Sometimes we forget how fragile we are. We might as well begin with trusting the Lord. In 1 Samuel in chapter 30 and verse 6. 1 Samuel in chapter 30 and verse 6. Now the scripture reads, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You know, this, this, this verse comes, a little bit of background on this. David found out that two of his wives had been taken captives. Uh, the people that he, were, uh, that he was leading, many of their loved ones, was the men he was leading, many of their loved ones 
were taken captive by the Amalekites, and David would just uh, go on his knees and weep uh, because his loved ones were taken and his men's uh, loved ones were taken. And in fact, some of them were so angry with David that they wanted to stone David because David was their leader. But we find a man uh, here who has a very different uh, method to dealing with despair, a very different method to dealing with discouragement. We find that David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He you see, a lot of times we talk about, when we talk about encouraging other people, we talk about either encouraging other people or being encouraged by, by other people. But we forget that as Christians, uh, we are able and we can encourage ourselves in the Lord. We have the word of the Lord. We have the promise of the Lord. We have the presence of the Lord. We have the Holy Spirit of the Lord. And we can encourage ourselves in the Lord. Every time we get discouraged, we are faced with a choice. Uh, let your eyes uh, linger on the problem uh, or, 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 and risk letting it turn into despair or turning your eyes on God and taking encouragement from Him. We have a choice. When you are disappointed, you are faced with two cards. Encouraging yourself in the Lord or allowing your dis dis discouragement and disappointments to turn into despair. Now we go back to our text uh, and we find after the magnificent display a still small voice. And note that up till this point, Elijah did not actually go up onto the mount before the Lord. And you say, how do you know that? God commanded him to go, did he not? If you go to 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 13, again, and it reads, And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and went out, and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him, and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? You see, the command was for him to stand on the mount, but we see that he was still in the cave. It was only after he heard the still small voice uh, that he went out and stood at the entering of the cave. And again, the Lord asked him the same question, and, it, and, and you would think by now Elijah would have learned from that great magnificent display. You would think he would have learned from all these things, uh, but again we find uh, Elijah giving the same reply. Uh, we find Elijah giving the same reply. And uh, of course God then eventually would command him to go and anoint uh, the successors for the king of Israel and the king of Syria and his own successor, uh, Elisha, but not before he tells him one more thing, one very important thing. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 18, in 1 Kings 19 and 18, the scripture reads, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. You see, Elijah was discouraged because he lost sight of God and because he didn't know what God knew. He was not the only one. There was a remnant. You know, we get discouraged because we forget the power of God and because sometimes we simply don't see the full picture. We don't see the whole picture. Elijah was so sure that he was the only one left. But you know something? He was off by 7,000%. He was off by 7%. Thousand. He was not off by one or two. He was off the charts. You see, it's 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 easy. Even now, it's it's easy to look at situations and to feel discouraged. And 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 and. Uh, uh, but we have to realize that God has a purpose, and not only does He have a purpose, uh, He knows exactly what is going on, even if we don't. You know, we look at the statistics on COVID-19, we look at the newspaper, we look at what's going on, all the, all the news, whether they be true or fake, and we look at all the statistics and the numbers. By the way, stats can be wrong, but God never is wrong. You know, we, we look at all these things and we start making predictions, we start thinking of, of uh, uh, what we think we know is happening. But don't forget, the whole picture is known only to God. No matter how great a prophet, 
Elijah was not told, and he didn't know, that there were 7,000 in Israel that had not bowed to Baal. Stats can be wrong, but God never is. There are three major lessons in God's counseling session with a despairing prophet. Number one, I am God. Don't forget. Number two, you are not indispensable. Number three, you got your facts wrong. You know, there's a quote by, by, uh, that I found, and it says, He that despairs degrades God and seems to intimate that he is insufficient or unfaithful to his word, and in vain hath read the scriptures, the world, and man. Let us get our encouragement from the Lord and one another. You see, another example is when Joshua was about to take leadership over Israel, God commanded Moses this. God commanded Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 3, Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 28, he says, but charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before his people, and he, sh he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. When God charges us to do something, he encourages us and he strengthens us. You know, when God gives us a charge, when God tells us to do something, to obey him, not only does he give us a command, he gives us the right amount of encouragement. That is why he is known as our counselor. He is known as our comforter and he encourages us and he strengthens us. You saw what he did for Elijah. He fed him, he gave him rest and then he showed him the power of God and then he, 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 he reminded him that, hey Elijah, you don't know what I do. There are 7,000 more. In Psalms 2 verses, that are very beautiful in Psalms 42 and verse 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. But mine eyes are unto thee in Psalms 141 and verse 8. Psalms 141 and verse 8. But mine eyes are unto thee, O God, the Lord. In thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. Friends, we are left with a choice. If you see the picture on the screen, you have discouragement, you have despair, and you have understanding. If we look down, if we look to the side, we are going to get uh, we're going to linger in the halls of discouragement and end up in the pit of despair. But if we look upward, if we understand that God is in full control, if we understand that we don't see the full picture, if we understand that everything that happens, happens because He allows it to happen, then we find that instead of drowning in, in, in despair, we end up in the Mount of Understanding. And after that, we find that we can be encouraged in the Lord. Like David, we can be encouraged in his word. And uh, just before we close this morning, I want to talk about a very, very important issue that all of us should remember. This morning, uh, this Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. And uh, for those of us that are believers, it's a very special day as we remember the day uh, the Lord Jesus overcame death. For those of us who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, as Christians, we do not despair because we have a hope. We have uh, an encouragement and we have a hope because of this very picture that you see. We, we have hope because of an empty tomb. You see, when, when, when God created man, God created man good. But man chose to disobey God. And, and man chose to sin. And the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. And, and today, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, you see, because God is so holy, He cannot have sin in His presence. But 2,000 years ago, the Lord sent His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for your sins and mine. 
so that we can be with him once more. You see, my friends, we cannot pay for our own sins. The Bible says that because of sin, we have to die. But Jesus paid for our sins because he lived a sinless life and because he is the Son of God. And he paid for our sins on that cross. In the book of John, in chapter 11, and verse 25 and 26, the scripture reads, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You see, my friends, if you do not know the Lord Jesus this morning, there really is no getting onto the Mount of Understanding. There really only is despair. But it doesn't have to be the case. The Bible says if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection. If you, if you believe in his atoning work and nothing else, not in our own good works, not in our own righteousness, you can be saved. And this empty tomb can be the cause of hope, the cause of encouragement for us. My friends, we do not serve. We do not serve a savior that is dead but we serve a Savior that is risen. We serve a Savior that a tomb could not hold, that death could not hold. And because He lives, we shall live also, come what may, come what may. And this morning, if you are discouraged, if you despair, come to Jesus. Ask him to encourage your soul and pray and, and seek comfort from his word and you will find that you will not be in that valley very long. But you will rise to the mount of understanding and joy that can be yours if you will only have faith. I pray that you will have a wonderful week, a blessed week, a safe week at home or wherever you are and that the peace and love of God be with you all. Thank you.